Speaking of our program, Phil Volrath, the Conductor of Public Affairs for Armed Forces Week, is now going to introduce our speaker, Phil. Thank you very much, Ms. Acting President. Um, as you know, we're celebrating Armed Forces Week this week, and uh, there will be events occurring every day, and that's what we're participating in today. Um, I'd like to present two of our officers of Armed Forces Week who are here today, our civilian chairman, Dr. Tom Buck, and Jim Pidelko, who's treasurer of uh, the Milwaukee Armed Forces Week. So. We're glad to have them with us, um, and uh, you'll be hearing uh, about our events as we go along. Um, we have as our speaker today, uh, Janine Saijan Rosina. Uh, she's dedicated herself to maintaining the legacy of her brother Lance with passion and pride. She is the owner of RDI, a commercial film photography studio. Janine is also an avid advocate from veterans issues to the arts, film, and leadership development. She lives in Milwaukee and has a son, Caleb Lance, and a daughter, Allie Jane. It is my honor and privilege to present Janine Saijan Rosina. Janine? Thank you so much for having me on Armed Forces Week. Uh, there he is. Quite a handsome young man, huh? Armed Forces Week, of course, is when we pay honor and give gratitude for all who have served in the past and present and the families that love them. We have quite a prolific community in Milwaukee that celebrates and commemorates Armed Forces every year. My parents were very much a part of it. Many, many of you that I see familiar faces knew them, Jane and Sil John. And as the years started creeping up on them, I became much more active in maintaining my brother's story. Lance received the Medal of Honor in March 1976 for his actions in Vietnam the last three months of his life. March 4th, we went to the White House to receive it from President Gerald Ford. It was a very emotional experience for us all. We really didn't know what had happened to Lance, and it was, wasn't until they read the citation that we started to learn more of what had happened to him. We grew up on the south side of Milwaukee in Bayview. 13 was a lucky number for my parents. They met on the 13th. They married on March 13th. They had their first baby April 13th, 13 months after they were married, which was Lance. That was 1942, and in 1946, my brother Mark arrived, and then I arrived in 1954. So if you're doing your math, it's 12 years between Lance and I. Because my father was a Depression-era child, his greatest contribution to our wellness and our family was working hard. He worked long, long hours, and, and Lance, Lance picked up that place in my life and became very father-like to me. I learned so many lessons from him. He paid such great attention to me. I was very blessed. He was one of the, the greatest forces in my life to develop who I was going to become. I was built and designed to do this. This is what I was built and designed to do. And what an honor to do it on behalf of my brother Lance. Lance attended Bayview High School. He applied for the Naval Academy and the Air Force Academy. He didn't make it into the Air Force Academy. And so he chose to go to Bainbridge Preparatory School in Bainbridge, Maryland 
A year later, he was then accepted at the Air Force Academy, which was newly built in Colorado Springs. It was only 1959 that they had actually built the academy. It started in 54 in Denver, and then they created the space in Colorado Springs. But prior to that, most don't realize that it was, it was also slated for right here in Wisconsin, in Lake Geneva. It would have been a very different state for us, I think, had they been a part of who we were as a state. At the academy, Lance struggled with his grades. Lance was much more of an artist. He was a musician, he was an artist, he was a photographer. And so some of the other traditional technical courses were very difficult for him, but he made it. He was on the academic probation list much more than he wasn't. And when I go out to the academy and I see the cadets there, I remind them of what that challenge is like to get back up over and over and over again when it looks like a dismal outcome. That would serve him well later in his life. When he was about to graduate in 1965, he wrote us a letter and he said, I don't think I'm gonna be graduating with my class. He was failing one of his courses. And at the very end, he pulled up his grades and he was able to graduate with the 1965 class. The program that year of which I have, in parentheses after his name says, will graduate later in summer because they didn't think he was gonna graduate either, but he did. Vietnam was ramping up and they were getting those guys quickly into training. Lance trained on the F4, and at that time, that was the, the, the one, the aircraft that everybody wanted to be in. After training, they pipelined them quickly to Vietnam. In June of 1967, June 26 to be exact, my brother did what he often did was come home and surprise me. It was my birthday. So he came home to be with me on my birthday before he was about to leave July 1st. I was too young, I was 13 years old, to understand what was going to be unfolding in front of me. The news wasn't available the way that we have it now. And I was young and innocent and didn't realize the severity of what the outcome could be. Lance landed in Da Nang in July. He ended up being the backseater of an F-4. They were sending in the guys in the front seat that had much more experience, and the guys in the back were just itching to get up in front. It was Lance's 52nd mission. As he prepared for that mission, he did what he always did and played taped music. It's always interesting to me the tells of someone and their choices. So when Hendrix and the Stones and psychedelic rock was all popular, he was listening to Barbara Streisand, classical music, Peter Gunn, The Letterman. And so he taped a message to us with that background soothing music playing and told us that the day before, a new commander had come in and was choosing who was going to be with him in the back seat. And so Lance went up on a, uh, a flight with him, and he decided that Lance was going to be his backseater. And, and Lance said, uh, he's kind of a tough guy to work with, a little tough on communication, but I guess I should be honored he chose me. So they were preparing for a mission that evening, and they were going to take out a bridge at the Ban Le Boy Ford, which was an area that there was high traffic for the North Vietnamese to come down with artillery trucks and it was actually in Laos. So they were gonna take out that bridge that evening. It was a night run. Fairly simple, he said. It was not going to be something very dangerous. The week prior to his last flight, there were some concerns at the base that there was a problem 
with a fuse that was in the ordinance in the bomb. And they felt that they were losing their comrades due to potential problems with that fuse that was exploding the ordinance before it was too far from the aircraft to be safe. When Lance went up that evening, he released the ordinance, and in fact, there was a problem with the fuse. It exploded less than a second before it was released. Lance ejected from his aircraft. Colonel Armstrong was in front. When Lance went through the ejection process, he lost his first aid kit. His helmet was ripped off his head. And he went plunging down to the jungle below. He got caught up in the triple canopy. He had to cut himself down with the ropes and fell to the limestone karst below. Limestone karst is very, very jagged, glass-like rock. The pilots knew that if they went down in Laos, it was going to be a very difficult, very difficult recovery. Most likely, they would not succeed, and he knew that. When he finally fell to the ground below, he assessed his injuries. Both of his hands had been broken and laid on top of his arms. He had a concussion, and he had a compound fracture four inches below the left knee, bone sticking out sharp through the skin. He knew he was in bad shape. He began to try and attend to his wounds. He didn't have his first aid kit. And he passed out and um, went under a tree. The next day, a pilot by the name of Jim Mack, flying a 105, heard the beeper, heard Lance's beeper. He made communicative contact with Lance, spoke on the radio, and Lance identified himself. Jim called back to command, and they said, ask him his authenticator sentence. Lance chose who's the greatest football team in the world. What do you suppose his answer was? The Green Bay Packers. So they started to talk. That, the rescue attempt began, and that started to create more obvious motion, action, activity in the Vietnam, the North Vietnamese Viet, began to come in. And it was very, very difficult. They were taking a lot of hits as they were trying to rescue him. The closest they got, Lance was about 100 yards away from the, air, the helicopter as it hovered. It hovered for 33 minutes, 33 minutes in the air. They were talking to Lance, and they said they were going to send the PJ down. Lance said, negative. I'm surrounded by the enemy. I'll crawl to you. So he began dragging himself backward on his elbows, trying to get to the helicopter. They sent the penetrator down for Lance to grab, but he couldn't make it to the penetrator. So they told him they had to leave, and they would be back for him the next day. Lance crawled into a sinkhole, fell onto his radio, and drained the battery. So they could never find him again. They came back the next day, but he was unable to be located. And so began Lance's arduous journey through the jungle and that emaciated condition no first aid kit, nobody there, alone. When we're alone, the chatter of the mind can take over. Nobody's coming back for me. Nobody cares about me. I mean, there's a whole lot of things that can happen. We've all had it in small, medium, and large ways when we're challenged with something and we're alone. But he didn't give up. So he began dragging himself through that jungle. The jungle, can you, if you can imagine, was similar to very gnarled, thorny bushes like a rose bush. And some of the smaller animals had made tunnels through the densest part. 
And that's what he crawled through, shredding his body. No food, no water. For 46 days, he pulled himself through that way. 210 pound Lance, six foot two, was barely 60 pounds on Christmas day when he collapsed on a road. The, the Vietnamese found him, put him on a truck and took him to a temporary holding camp. They put him on a table and put a guard with him. Lance motioned the guard down to ask him a question. When the guard leaned down in that condition, Lance placed a well-placed karate chop and knocked him out. Lance rolled off the table to a hard fall, couldn't, couldn't brace himself for that fall, and crawled back out into the jungle. It took the villagers a half a day to find him. They brought him back, and they put a heavy iron cast on his legs so that he could not be mobile anymore. They transported him to a temporary holding camp called the Bamboo Prison in Vin. Four by four foot dirt floor cells, three on each side with a hall between. There were two other pilots that had gone down and were captured and were put in that same bamboo prison. Guy Gruders was one of them. Lance had gone to the Air Force Academy with Guy. Guy and Lance were in the same squadron together. When the interrogator came through, he went to Guy and Bob Craner, who was his co-pilot, and said, take the guy across the hall back to the stream. He stinks. They went in and got him. And as they picked him up, Guy said, I, I thought it was a child. 80% of Lance's body was open wound. Bones were visible. He had shredded off all of the flesh on his backside from, from pulling himself backward. The hip bones were completely visible. Guy didn't know who it was. And Lance said, Guy, is that you? And Guy said, yeah, who are you? He said, it's me, Lance. Lance Sijon. Guy said his heart just broke. He couldn't believe the six foot two football player from Milwaukee, Wisconsin was so diminished. They began to torture Lance in that cell, beating him on the open wounds. There was no flesh left on Lance's body to absorb those hits. So everything struck the bone, everything struck the open wound. Guy and Bob could hear them beating and torturing him. And Lance said, I can't tell you anything. It's against the code. He adhered to the code of conduct so strictly he would only give them name, rank, and serial number. He wouldn't divulge anything else. They began to transport them up to Hanoi which is where the Wallow Prison was, often known as the Hanoi Hilton. It was 10 days of traveling on those monsoon pitted dark dirt, dirt roads. It was a flatbed truck that they put Bob and Guy and Lance in. There were two 55 gallon drums of gas untethered that kept flying all over the back of the truck. So one would protect those drums from falling onto Lance while the other cradled Lance in, his, in, their, in their arms. Lance had lost consciousness. Guy tried to feed him, but Lance couldn't, couldn't eat. At one point, they stopped at a village 
and they pulled back the tarp to show the villagers what they had, American prisoners, as a trophy. Lance was so emaciated that the crowd just gasped. The guy said he didn't even look human. Ten days later, they were arriving at the Hanoi Hilton, and they put Lance in solitary confinement and continued to beat him and torture him and interrogate him and use him as an example. If you don't tell us something, we'll beat you seconds of your life. The POWs were very valuable to the North Vietnamese. They didn't want them to die. They knew how to just, just get to the place where they were just short of death. What they would do is they would seat the POW on the ground. They would pull their arms back, tie with ropes their elbows and their, and their wrists and then rotate those arms over the shoulders to break out the shoulders. Then they would put them on a hook and raise them so that they could continue to beat them. And that's what they did to them. Eventually, Lance was so weak, they didn't want him to die. They wanted him to stay alive so that they could use him as a barter. They put Guy Gruders and Bob Craner into the cell with Lance to try and feed him, to try and comfort him. There were sawhorse beds with just boards over them, three of them for them to be in. There was something akin to a blanket. There was standing water in each one of the cells. Lance kept throwing off the blanket. Everything stuck to his body. He gained consciousness in and out for the next four or five days. On January 21st, Lance sat up in one of the strongest voices he had had the entire time that Bob and Guy were with him. And he said, Dad, this is it. Where are you? I need you. In Lance's final words, it wasn't hate for his captors. It was love for his family. People ask me, how did he do what he did? I can only surmise, but I know by what he did at his last moment that it was love. He thought of us back home. He thought of us to get home. I'm sure he felt his job wasn't done with his family and his comrades and his nation. So his last breath was love. Love is tangible. It's as powerful as plugging in to a wall socket. That energy is there. We just can't see it. But we know it's there. We feel it. On January 22nd, they had taken Lance away on the 21st, and he died. January 22nd, 1968. Our family just knew he was missing in action. So we didn't know what had happened to him. In 1973, when the war was over, there were lists that came out, and it showed that Lance was a POW. We really didn't know what that meant. We didn't know what was happening. Media didn't have that kind of information back then, and so it was still quite a mystery for us. In 1974, we came to know that when Lance died in 68, they had so much respect for him 
even though he was their nemesis. That they buried him. They marked his gravesite with his initials. Somebody chiseled that in that stone. I often wonder who that was. They exhumed his remains and they brought him back home, back to our family. We went to the United Airlines cargo building at the time. We've learned a lot about what happens to families and how people are returned and we didn't really know back then. So we went to the cargo facility and um, it was March 13th, my parents' wedding anniversary and their son returned home. We still really didn't know what had happened to Lance. The other POWs returned, Bob Craner and Guy Gruders, who were a witness to Lance in the last month of his life. Bob Craner recommended Lance for a Medal of Honor. They were going through a process to try and come back and integrate back into a life that they didn't even know anymore. Imagine, I've talked to so many of the POWs, imagine that during those interrogations, they promised them things. They were trying to befriend them, but they knew it was, it was just to, to glean information so that their comrades, their nation would be in danger. So everything that person said to them across the table was a lie. And now they're supposed to come back home and believe everyone. It was so difficult for them, their families, the bankers sitting across the table. It was really challenging for all of them. We didn't know any of them. And it wasn't until 1976, when Lance received the Medal of Honor in March, in June of that same year, they named the dormitory at the Air Force Academy that was called the New Dorm up until 1976, Cy John Hall. So our whole family went out to be part of that, de that dedication and that celebration of his life. We tried to celebrate his life. We were so heavy in pain, so heavy in pain, for six years not knowing what had happened. When I became a mother, I couldn't imagine what that could be like. I couldn't imagine. That's where we met Guy Gruders. We sat at the table with Guy. Guy became such a strong Christian as he was a POW. He was so angry at what they had done to his friend that for years he was on his knees praying that God would help him forgive them so that he could be free again. He said over and over, I prayed, I forgive them, I forgive them, I forgive them. He said, and I didn't mean it. So I was still captured in that angst and that anger and that dark place. But one day, God touched him, and he forgave them, and he became free again. So that story of, of Lance and what had happened to him, he, he tells people that it's, it's because of Lance that he was such a strong Christian. But at the same time, for Guy, he could tell that story in such detail because it was his moment that he found freedom. So he was telling us things across the table that we had never heard. We didn't know he was emaciated. We didn't, we didn't, I don't think our minds would let us go there. I don't think we could imagine that that, that had happened. We, we didn't know, and who was going to tell us? Who could tell us that information? Such a burden for so many to be able to have to tell us. 
But in the prison camp, they had developed an incredible way of communicating. They had a tap code. Some of you may have heard of that. So every letter in the alphabet had a number that it was attached to so that they could tap on the walls and, and full sentences and tell each other and, and encourage each other and support each other. And once they understood that tap code, they didn't feel as alone. Alone is where it happens. Alone is where our mind just takes us to places that's just not good for us. So they tapped out Lance's story, and they all stood a little taller and felt a little stronger because of what he chose to do. Guy began to tell us the details, and we were mortified. We were shredded. We just felt shredded at this wonderful moment of dedicating this building. And finally, his wife realized how difficult it was for us to hear it, and she asked him to stop. So that bit of information we had was about the most we could, we could sustain at that moment. Then the book came out into the mouth of the cat. Many of you have read that. I've never read it. I couldn't sit that long in my own thoughts and read those words. I know everything that happened to Lance. I made a film about Lance. It took me 10 years to do with the support and love of the community I'm involved in, the film community, and we made a film and I, that I wrote, directed, and produced. And in that information gathering and in all those interviews, I had more information coming to me in doses that I could sustain. But it taught me so much. I knew Lance long before the last three months of his life. I knew him in a different way. I knew the softer Lance. I knew the Lance that in high school, when he was awarded the king in The King and I in the musical, and they said, we need a little princess, he said, I'm going to get my sister. She's three. I'm going to go get her. He came home and told my mom, I want Janine to be in The King and I. And she said, who's going to watch her? And he said, I will. That's unusual. That's unusual for a big strapping guy who's, who's the uh, all-city end on the football team and in musical theater, and the president of SGA, I often tell people he knew himself so well that he didn't have to define who he was by the peer group. What better gift could you direct your children to do or your grandchildren? Know yourself. You, you won't be as influenced by all those around you. It's why, as parents, we want our kids to hang out with good kids. We know what's going to happen if they don't. So Lance knew himself well enough that he was comfortable with a relationship with his, with his sister, who's three. That's so unusual. God's plan is amazing. I became the gatekeeper for Lance's story partly because of that connection I had with him, partly because of his courage to stay connected to me. Often when I'm speaking at different bases and I ask how many have little sisters at home, I say, she's watching everything you do. She knows how you walk. She knows how you talk the adoring younger sister that looks at her brother. And particularly when there's that much space between us, there was no competition or jealousy. So he knew himself well enough. And that was developed long before we got here, I believe. If we end Lance's life on January 22nd, 1968, it's a very tragic story indeed. But if we don't, by example, each of us in our own way has an opportunity to light the path for those who follow us. 
We live in concentric circles. We're not alone. Every choice we make, it touches someone. Lance defined for me and many others what it meant to be totally free. And usually, as he was a POW, ironically, in the face of his captors, he was free to love his God, his family, his nation, his comrades. He never divulged any information to put them in harm's way. That was his total freedom. He would not give in. No matter where we are, what we're doing, it's our choice. His is an extreme example. What contrast to be so free in that cell. The mind is a powerful thing. The heart is even more powerful. Mark Twain said, the two most important days in your life are the day you're born and the day you find out why. Why are you here? What will you become? What have you become? Would you like to retool that? It's never too late. So many men and women that have come to know his story have come to me and said, when I came to know Lance's story and the intimacy of what he had done, I thought to myself, in any challenge I'm in in my life now, if he could do that, then I can do this. Whatever your this is, mark that young man and what he chose as his this. And you'll find a path to determine how to get through your challenge. Don't skirt it. Don't go around it. It'll never go away. You have to go through it. Don't take things personally. Always do your best. Be impeccable with your word. And never assume anything. Thank you so much for allowing me to be with you today. We have a screening of the film this evening. I invite you to come. It's a very powerful film. It's at 6.30. You'll discover many things about Lance that I couldn't tell you today. Um, and lots of imagery of the family. And it's, it's pretty incredible, the archival footage that I have. So again, on behalf of Cy John's past, present, and future, I thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. If anyone has a question, even in regard to the film, that was a very interesting journey. Um, all questions I enjoy, and it's, it's difficult to be the first one. So I always say, who wants to be the most courageous? We're talking about courage here. So who wants to be the most courageous? Hi there, Tam. Tam um, had been so supportive. Tam is a VP at uh, BBK, which is an ad agency. And her father and her brothers and her son, no, oh, there was, oh, niece, right? Yeah, niece is what I was trying to think. They all went to the Air Force Academy. And when I had been trying to relocate the F4C that was at the 440th originally, and I wanted to move it to the front of Mitchell International Airport, unfunded, no funding. Um, you know, I think if we can move mountains, we can move an F4. So I, I wanted to create a plaza for Lance, which I did. And Colonel Tom, her dad, who I love, called her and said, Tam, you've got to help this woman. She just needs some help. And so... She called me, and I showed up 30 seconds later in her office, and she can tell you about that because I think she thought I was a crazy woman coming in and telling her all the thoughts that I had and what I wanted to do. But Tam was really instrumental, and the agency then became a great support for us in all things Team Sai John.
Thanks, Tam. Oh, this on? Can you hear me? Am I on? Yeah. You're on. on. Come close, though. So my question is about leadership development. Mm -hmm. That was one thing when you and I first met that was really intriguing to me. What's your vision for how to use this film um, and other things to really use it as a tool for leadership development here in Milwaukee? There's so many people who don't know Lance's story. Right. And to me, that's a travesty. How, what's your vision for that and how can we help? Oh, thank you, Tam. It was one of the third things that I wanted to do. So I sat in her office and said, I want to do a film. I want to build a plaza. And I want um, educational outreach and leadership and resilience. Um, we've got two done. And we're touching education. Uh, I have a couple of different programs that are in middle schools and high schools. I would like to see it develop into all MPS schools. Um, what we have done at this point is have them read the book into the mouth of the cat, and then I come after that, and we start to talk about a much more personal side of the development of Lance and how does somebody find that road to become that individual. And some of the things we talk about is just that character development. Know yourself so that you are not influenced by others and you can stay on the right side of right. Um, the War Memorial has also got a tremendous educational program now that they have developed, and one of the sections of it is All Lands. And that's an online program that people are getting all over the nation to determine how to develop these kinds of skills. So there, there's a whole progression of things that are done for that leadership training. My desire would be to do experiential leadership training so that we have groups that are taken out of the atmosphere that they, the, the classroom, I mean, it's really tough to feel that emotional pull at who you are and what you are as some of the peer group is judging you and um, that traditional teacher talks, we listen. I'd really like experiential learning so that they go out and we do some sort of summer program, particularly at the academy, I'm developing a program with um, a charter school out there that will be taking kids up into the mountains and doing some educational training in their teamwork and individual. Um, how, can, how can we do it here? Well, Tim, <laughs> that's the tough one because uh, I'm not very good at... Um, getting financial support. Everything I've ever done has been very organic and people have come around to help. Um, that's going to take uh, a, a lot of funding to be able to develop that program. And so if I can get that part of it started, then I will be able to have uh, professionals come in and develop that program. But thanks for bringing that up. Mm -hmm. You spoke about others' uh, journey through uh, through this to forgiveness. What about your journey to forgiveness? Thank you. I think when I was young, I didn't allow the anger and the hate to even come in because I was so hopeful he was coming home. I was going to be the one that remained that said, I, I never gave up. And that's that youth and optimism. And I, um, I wouldn't allow that to come in. I think when it was clear that it was over, I was so deeply in my pain that I didn't look outward. I was really struggling with it. When I began to look for answers just for my life, for his life, what that meant, it, it didn't, hatred did not come into the equation for me. And later I heard a statement in my late 20s that I think guided me. That kind of hatred and anger is like, me swallowing poison and expecting you to choke. If I swallow the poison, if I swallow that hatred and anger, I'll choke. I knew how full of love Lance was. 
I would not honor him if that was connected to hate. I was very, very sad for the loss. I'm still sad for the loss. Every high holiday, I think about what his contribution would be if he was with us. My children. But yes, I have forgiven them long ago. I know the devastation we caused to them too. War's ugly. The carnage is horrific on both sides. I don't pretend that um, both participate in some pretty horrific practices, and I know it's necessary. I know it's a t that's the tougher one for me, is how we continue to resolve conflict. I'd like to have grandmas in a room and have a yarn off, a knit off. That's what I'd like. <laughs> Let the sages knit off and decide, you know, what's going to happen. But, um, and I think um, until things change, we, we so badly need those who serve and protect and defend us. And I have such respect and honor and gratitude to them all. I'm hoping the next generations will continue to find ways that we can resolve conflict and it's not involved with hate.